Well, it being 900.00, we will begin the proceedings of the dialogue. Uh, I want to welcome all dialogue participants uh, to Adelaide and for the Chinese participants uh, to Australia. As is customary in Australia, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, uh, the Paramunk and Ghana people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. These are the first Australians who have lived in the lands and waters of the Adelaide region for more than 40,000 years, and they have maintained a continuous connection between this land, their culture and country. Both delegations experienced that connection yesterday with a welcome to country and a smoking ceremony as part of our visit to the Art Gallery of South Australia. I'm very grateful to the Art Gallery uh, for doing that. I also wish to acknowledge the co-chair of the delegation, Mr Wang Chao, uh, President of the Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much. And welcome also uh, representing Mr Li Jiao Xing, who we met last year in Beijing at the dialogue. And I want to thank China for the warm hospitality uh, the Australian delegation received in Beijing last year, and I hope we can reciprocate and move the fog, which should happen within the next half hour. That's the plan. Um, Australia values the regular engagement and dialogue with China under our comprehensive strategic partnership, which marks its 10th anniversary this year, and I was delighted um, 11 years ago uh, to uh, go to Beijing with Prime Minister Gillard where we signed an initial agreement and uh, that was subsequently made into a comprehensive strategic partnership. Uh, we had a very good discussion um, with um, President Xi and uh, at the Great Hall of the People was the signing um, with um, uh, Premier Li uh, Keqiang. Australia uh, Premier Lee's visit to Australia in June, like uh, Prime Minister Albanese's visit to China last November, supported the ongoing stabilisation of the relationship between our two countries. Australia and China agreed to renew dialogue and foster closer cooperation on trade and economic issues, education and research, and climate change and culture. As it did last year, the high-level di high dialogue provides us an opportunity to discuss these and other areas of uh, possible cooperation. The participants here today reflect the breadth of the relations between Australia and China, with senior representatives uh, with experience in politics, in government, trade, education, culture, climate change and international relations, so you can see the breadth of the dialogue that will take place. Just as we grow cooperation in areas of mutual benefit, we will still have differences and we will be able to discuss those differences. Australians are keen to see the removal of remaining trade impediments uh, on Australian live rock lobster and some red meat establishments and we take a strong interest in matters such as the detention of Australian citizens and human rights. Uh, we welcome the growing people-to-people -people exchanges and deep, the deepening of the bilateral relationship. This includes the increasing number of students, tourists and business people travelling in both directions. I particularly want to welcome the reciprocal access to multi-entry visas of up to three to five years duration and China, including Australia in its 15-day visa waiver program. Education is and will continue to be a mainstay of the relationship between Australia and China and our people-to-people -people links. When our students, researchers and institutes work together on shared challenges, we can often find better solutions and obviously get to know each other better. In June of this year, the Prime Minister and Premier Lee reinforced their commitment to cooperate on climate change, and I expect that to be a very important topic of the discussion today. Um, 
We have a strong history of uh, science and technology collaboration and deep links between our research institutes. Our delegation also includes experts in arts and culture uh, and collaboration in this area remains a powerful way to build shared understanding. This remains a time of growing strategic competition and conflict in Ukraine and the Middle East. Australians take a strong interest in the global rules and norms that underpin our prosperity and security, and that's a subject to which we will return today. And it's good to talk about these issues directly and candidly and regularly, and I look forward to our discussion today. This is the first dialogue hosted in Australia by the National Foundation for Australia-China Relations since it was established in 2020. As a strong supporter of dialogues, institutional linkages and two-way exchanges, the Foundation is helping Australians to make valuable, practical connections with the people of China. So I welcome our guests. Uh, we had a great dialogue last year, and I'm sure we'll have an even better one this year. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Co-Chair Emerson. Thank you for your gracious welcome to the Chinese delegation. As well as your gracious remarks just now, the Chinese delegation is very happy to be here for the eighth meeting of the high-level dialogue. Here, I will read the address by the Foreign Foreign, Foreign Minister, Mr. Li Zhaoxing, the Honorable Mr. Emerson, ladies and gentlemen, friends. It's a pity that I cannot make it here in Australia for the eighth meeting of the China-Australia High-Level Dialogue. So I have asked Mr. Wang Chao, the Executive Head of Delegation, and the President of CPIFA to express my greetings to all of you and to read this address for me. Last September, we met at the State Guest House of Diao Yutai in Beijing, and we put forward a lot of constructive suggestions on how to improve the China-Australian relations. And that has served as an important reference for our two governments. Over the past year and more, under the strategic leadership of our two leaders, our relations have got back on track and are showing great momentum of development. So this dialogue has played a positive role and its value is unique. I'm very happy to see this. Today, our delegates are here in Adelaide and we're here to provide our insights on how to further improve our relations. This means a lot. Adelaide also has a special meaning in the development of our bilateral relations. The Mr. Whitlam made the decision to start the ice-breaking journey to China, and the first pair of giant pandas lived in Adelaide. So this is the first for the giant pandas to reside in the Southern Hemisphere. Two months ago, Premier Li Chang ch chose Adelaide as the first stop in Australia. I sincerely hope that this dialogue will be a fruitful one in Adelaide. On China-Australia relations, since 2016, when the, when the mechanism of dialogue was established, I have emphasized every time that despite different focus, what I mean remains the same. That is, we need to think about how to promote the steady and sustained development of China-Australia relations. Now, every one of us knows very well about how important it is for us to make China-Australia relations right. The issue is not whether we should make it right, but how to make it right. So today, I'd like to share with you several points on how to see our agreements and the areas maybe we disagree on. Last year, I said that 
how far can the China-Australia relations can continue to improve and develop is determined by whether we have a right perception towards each other. Yet the right perception doesn't just fall from the sky. Rather, it has to be tried and adjusted and tried and adjusted again. This is a long-term process. So the right perception formed during the process under most circumstances takes the form of agreement. But sometimes it turns out as some objective disagreements. So all these agreements and disagreements play with each other to shape the fundamentals of our relations. Neither agreements nor disagreements will disappear automatically. Even in the golden areas of our bilateral relations, we still have our differences. Similarly, in the low app of our bilateral relations, the agreements still exist. So a sound bilateral relations should focus on agreements and we need to properly address and transcend our differences. We need to build a more mature, stable, and fruitful, comprehensive strategic partnership. Then how to do this? I wish to share with you three observations, some food for thought. First, the most fundamental consensus between our two countries is that we should be partners of each other. We have so many common interests, and we have a lot of areas we can agree on. The most fundamental one is that we're not rivals or enemies to each other. Instead, we're friends and partners. So this consensus was established in the 1970s, when our two countries established diplomatic ties. At that time, the world was amid the Cold War, when the two superpowers were rivaling with each other. So at, at that time, China and Australia had as many differences as we have today. But that didn't stand in the way of our efforts to establish diplomatic ties, because at that time, we already saw that our interactions would serve our long-term interest. It is because of this consensus that over the past 50 plus years, China Australia relations has led the way in the relations between China and Western developed countries, del delivering huge benefits to our two peoples. Our trade in goods increased from 130 million Australian dollars back in 1972 to over 300 billion Australian dollars last year. And the Chinese students studying in Australia increased from only five in 1973 to 190,000 today. Australia has run a trade surplus with China for over 20 years, and there are many other examples. Just imagine if the fundamental consensus that we should be partners to each other is weakened or even discarded, then how can we continue this close and mutually beneficial cooperation? Second. The biggest difference between us is how Australia views China. We in China often cite a proverb that is calling a deer, pointing at a deer, but call it a horse. If you insist on seeing a deer as a horse, you will interpret what the deer does from the perspective of the horse. So that will lead to misunderstanding and misinterpretation. Since the beginning of the 19th century, between our two peoples first interacted with each other, the differences also exist, always existed. This is because of our different history, culture, political system, and stages of development. So among all the differences, there is a discrepancy between how Australia sees China and what China really is. In modern times, China once shut its door to the outside world. That resulted in our backwardness, and we came under attack, and we suffered from 100 years of humiliation. So that determined our strategic intention, that is to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation instead of compete with any other country. 
What we want the most is to run our own affairs well instead of poke our nose into others' business. That said, China will firmly safeguard its sovereignty, security, and development interests on these issues. To properly address our differences is a basic requirement, but we must do much more than that, because only by transcending our differences can we really avoid defining our relations by differences. Third, the external factors should not become a problem between China and Australia. Now the world is undergoing profound and complex changes. Many people are talking about the so-called strategic competition between China and the United States. China is trying to build itself into a great modern country through Chinese modernization. We have no intention to engage in the so-called strategic competition, and the strategic competition is just a pretext of a certain country to suppress and contain China. Last year, I said something to the effect that every country will need its partner as much as its allies. So how Australia handles its relations with the third country is Australia's own business. But China hopes that Australia will see that China is a peaceful and independent country. No external pressure will change and remodel China. Australia is a middle power, and you have the capacity to deal with China independently. The world will be a multipolar and globalized one, and I hope that Australia will stand in the right side of history, uphold multilateralism and trade, liberation and free trade, and oppose block politics and don't take sides. Instead, I hope Australia will oppose the new Cold War with the majority of the international community and contribute more to world peace and development. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the sustained and sound development of China-Australia relations serves the fundamental interests of our two countries. It also contributes to peace, stability, and prosperity of Asia-Pacific and the world at large. In developing its relations with Australia, China is sincere, and we hope that the Australian side can reciprocate our sincerity so that we can work together to ensure that our relations will enjoy a brighter future in the right track. In closing, I wish this dialogue a full success. Thank you. This is the address by former Foreign Minister Li Zhaoxing. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that ends the opening remarks. If I could um, politely.